over to where we want to go. We need to do training. I am the camp manager. We basically do camp management, uh, protection of civilian sites, and um, we coordinate with different partners to try and ensure that we give the services uh, required. It's really related, you know, yes. This side yeah, and also this. Okay, you put this point in conference. If they say yes. Particularly, we try to see that all the people in the POC have equal access to the different services that are provided here. For instance, we pay particular attention to the vulnerable group, like the elderly, like the women uh, and children. And what we also deal is with issues of registration. We want also to understand uh, when people come in, why are, they, why are they coming to this site? And also follow up, make sure that people are registered if they have the right to be registered. And also that people are informed of, of the services that are available in this site. Malakal had a population of like 170,000 people. It's right now the town is empty. Um, we have uh, maybe SPLS soldiers there. In December, there was an attack in Malakal. We didn't know really how it took place. But we hear the shooting in the morning, and the people begin to fear we hide ourselves and what and what. So after that, we learned that there was uh, some uh, rebels who came, where most of the civilians were killed, houses were looted, Houses were burned. That is why now people are still living in Hunamex. I think it was quite wild. Uh, the people started breaking in the compound. And as I said, as the United Nations personnel was not prepared, it did not happen in an orderly fashion. The reason why people are here is because they do not feel safe outside, so they came here for physical protection, which also limits them in many ways. They are not free to go out, they cannot sustain themselves. We have three different groups of uh, displaced communities living in the camp, and one of the two groups uh, are actually uh, their relationship at national level is basically the source of the overall conflict. So we, we have to pay very much attention that the conflict that is happening a large scale in South Sudan does not replicate the same dynamics inside the camp. So in order to assure that daily dialogue with these groups is paramount and we try to connect them all and uh, bring them on board in a positive way, try to mitigate these risks. It's quite horrific, I mean a, a lot of people living in, in water and it's really terrible and um, some places are stacked in water and uh, the environmental conditions here are quite challenging because when it rains, water doesn't run away, you'll just stay and it becomes stagnant waters. And now it becomes a rainy season. The place is, uh, is uh, bloody and uh, it is difficult, especially when it rains. It is difficult, you can, you can notice from uh, the way how we have just moved in uh, was in the, on the street. You find some of the, of the shelters are in the water. This is where I'm living.
So each person living in a camp should have at least 30 square meters for uh, uh, living space. In this camp, each person has only 4.7 square meters. So congestion is one of the major problems we are having in this camp because besides uh, not being very human as such, it's also increased the risk of spreading of diseases. So the number of malaria cases uh, increased a lot in the past weeks. Wash all fruits and vegetables properly with safe and clean water. Ensure that food is thoroughly cooked and served and eaten while still very hot. Cholera germs cannot survive in very hot and properly cooked food. When you see any of your brothers and sisters in the community with the symptoms of cholera, don't wait. Urgently seek treatment for all community members. We all pledge to follow five steps of protection against cholera. Our community will be safe. Due to rain and uh, insecurity, we cannot be able to uh, get our stuff here by road and it's quite far. The roads are, the infrastructure, road infrastructure is not good. So the only way we can be able to do it is uh, by air. You know, we have to charter flights. There was a system in place to deliver goods by barges and, and boats, but has been jeopardized by the conflict. Security-wise is uh, isolated, geographically speaking. Uh, so everything that we are bringing here, all the supplies, all the materials, uh, has to be flown uh, by plane. Um, it is very expensive uh, to do this uh, level of operations and also uh, it poses a lot of risks because in case that Malakal uh, is uh, out of control again in terms of security, uh, then all the operations uh, have to, have to it's gonna, uh, they are going to be halted. And this is, a, this is a real issue that we have already experienced. Uh, at the beginning uh, we, were, we had for six weeks only two flights uh, from the block clusters and that uh, posed uh, a lot of limitations to our operations. At night, we have had cases of um, the women fearing uh, to go to the latrines because of um, SGBV and uh, such related violences. Even if you look at the population here, you will have you will see that there's actually a majority of women in the camp, um, and there is a majority of female-headed households. Through all this, women have been suffering. Women are raped. Children are adopted. Women are beaten. Women are threatened, and women face suffer all the consequences of this of this war. Uh, the cluster system was uh, introduced as a way to. Better, better coordinate people working in the same areas, for instance, protection. So in different areas, in, you will have different clusters, for instance, as protection and NFI. Uh, so it will be the actors working in those areas coming together and coordinating and finding out how they can uh, complement each other instead of overlapping. Talk of wash, that's water and sanitation. So provision of water to the IDPs and sanitation facilities to the ID, IDPs, latrines, and also um, hygiene promotion. We are having the food distribution going on of the IDPs, and uh, it's been a process that has been going on since last week, uh, for the last uh, five days. Um, we have the IDP is coming over and uh, they are received by IM registration guys where they present the card, registration card and it's checked and verified and then they move over to the World Vision guys who will stamp it 
and also ink. They also inked so that uh, we don't have a repetition of the collection of food. Then from there they move to the collection point where they are given their rations. The IDPs they were not receiving water at all. So in four or five days, uh, IOM had to set up this, emer this emergency system. Uh, we have one intake um, and then uh, over there we have the water pump. And with that water pump, uh, we are able to provide a flow of 12 cubic meters um, per hour. Uh, that gives us around 150 and 200,000 uh, uh, liters per day. With uh, this amount of water, we, uh, we are able to provide between around 13, 15 uh, liters per person per day uh, of safety drinking waters uh, for the IDPs. And then we have health services that are being offered to them. We have um, IMC, we have MSF, who are assisting in giving uh, health facilities and running the hospitals within, within the POC. Then we also have shelter, security provision, which, mainly, which is mainly done by UNMIS. We have around two million, two million and a half of aqua tabs that expired in 2017 and we are trying to get them back to the track. Uh, this is one of the few supplies that were left after the attacks in Malakal. So, and it's very important because with the cholera campaign that uh, it's now ongoing, uh, we will be able to provide purification of, uh, of water buckets uh, in different places in Upper Nile. Another thing that camp management together with other partners have started is a women's committee. And that, the idea is that that committee can serve several purposes. One, that women can discuss among themselves what are the issues and then they can bring it forward to the um, partners working there, humanitarian partners working there. The crisis that happened to Malakal and Malakal, many women, some of them got killed, some were raped, some were abducted, even children. We, we have missing people up to now, which we don't know where they were taken. This can cause harm to their bodies. It has been agreed that there are two health providers where survivors of gender-based violence can go. One of them MSF and the other IMC Center. Um, so they can go there and receive medical treatment. Uh, but what is also available is psychosocial counseling. The drains are just the camp manager could not enter the camps, could not do anything without our help. And we cannot also do succeed in making anything without him, so, so that uh, he is also the representative of the, of the UNIMIS too. Okay? We are working collectively with him. He has got any problem, we come and share it. We have got problem, we, 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 we tell him, then we, we, we share it. And all of us go back to Unimish. That's the whole umbrella. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for, for the um, agenda that you've mentioned from your end. And um, as a camp management and shelter, we have trying to think of how we can, we can partner with the leaders. We'll come up with something and uh, we'll present to you on how we can be able to work together to assist in this. They're living in a pathetic condition right now. Yeah. That's why there's really need to try as much as possible to improve the conditions that they're living in. But for me as a citizen of this country, I wish South Sudan one day will be a good country. But when? I cannot determine that. Yeah. If people really think of this country all, then there will be some changes, either from this government or the other government. This is where there could be a good future for the South Sudan.